None? There's a lot of discussion about something back here, so if you've got questions, I'll be glad to help you. Number eight. All right, now, you don't have to make up questions, okay? I mean, if you don't have questions, you're just intelligent beings that don't need questions, all right? That's fine. Is that one there, right? Cosine x. All right. Now, a little piece of information that I did not give you yesterday. Your calculator for this class should be in radian mode. For those of you that are taking AP Physics, you have to swap to degree mode for third period, but you have to swap back to radian mode for first period. So if you're trying to graph that puppy, you've got to be in radian mode in order to graph it. Also, you need to be in radian mode in order to evaluate the function at these things. So that's my guess is the big problem that you had there. If you were in degree mode still, it messes everything up there. If you go to radian mode, it works out pretty well there. Did it work out pretty well with mm, That doesn't look right to me. That doesn't look like to me, right to me. Let's see. Let's see if I can get there and figure something out. All right. The easier. Okay, if you're in radians, then you should be good to go. All right. I know. I just want to log in. I don't want to see. Yeah, well, let's calculate. Let me sign in. Come on. Okay. Desmos is hard to do the table with, I think. What's our function? Cos uh, we've got y equals... Cosine x minus 1, but all of that needs to be in a parenthesis. This is this, this. divided by x. All right, so there's my, what my graph looks like. Okay, well, good. There's what my graph looks like. Um, if I am looking, I'm looking to determine around 0, it looks like. So if I were looking at this graph, just as a quick here, I would say it looks like it's approaching zero just looking at the graph there. Um, if I were to, oh, can I zoom this thing? It doesn't like to. Oh, yeah, there we go. If I were to zoom in, it still looks like that. You know, you can zoom forever here if you really want to. Um, Everything looks like it's pointing to zero to me. So just looking at the graph, that would be my speculation. So what I would suggest then is when I look at the numbers, I should, would expect them to be, I'd expect these numbers over here, here, all of the negative ones, all the negative ones to be slightly positive. I'd expect these to be slightly negative and let, expect them to be getting closer and closer to zero. So if you got that information, I would say you're in a pretty good place there. Okay? What other questions might we have? I mean, I'll be glad to look at it and give you answers as I graph it, as I look at it tonight. Homework due times and all, okay? I want my class to be as low a stress as it can be, okay? So no one needs to fret over I didn't get last night's homework done and turned in on time, okay? As long as that does not become habitual, I am okay with that. You are young adults. You have other things going on. It becomes a problem when Macy is two weeks behind in FRQs and she's got six FRQs that she still hasn't done and she's got two homeworks. Now it's a problem, okay? But just I'm running behind a little bit is not the end of the world. It also becomes a problem when Mr. West calls a class meeting without me and says, look, nobody's going to do the FRQs this week, and he will just postpone them till the next week and get us a week off there, okay? Then it becomes a problem, but it becomes a problem for you because I normally don't give in to that. I just let you be a week behind, all of you, with that and give you three more to do. So... Just as long as you're working your hardest to get to the right place and get stuff done, you're going to be in good shape there. All right, so I'm not hearing. If you have questions about this that you want to ask me individually, I'll be glad to go over some of these. Uh, uh, one question that was asked here by, uh, by a few people, and I just want to clarify, says, using the graph of F, identify the values of C for which the limit exists. All right? 
for which the limit exists. Now, another way to ask that question is where does the limit not exist? Okay, and that's answering the same question because if you start talking about where does it exist, well, does it exist at 6? Yes. What about 5.9? Yes, 5.8, 5.75. I mean, you know, there's a blue million of them there. But where does it not exist at? And hopefully as you look at it, you said, all right, right there, it's not exist. Why is the limit non-existent there, Ms. Harper? Going two different places. If I look at it from the left, what would I think the limit is? Zero. And if I look at it from the right, uh, Mr. Dietrich, what would I think the limit is? If I'm looking at zero from the right, I would think the limit is? I understand. This this right over here, from the right. Yeah, five. I got you. All right. So from the right, it would we would think that it's five there. Okay. Now, did anyone think there's another place that the limit does not exist? At negative 2 here, okay? And that would be a point of argument, I think, for you, okay? Because remember, what did we, what does this remind, what do you think, why is this a place of argument? Okay, I think we could argue here that the limit does not exist. Or we could argue that the limit is negative infinity. Remember, I told you yesterday that we were going to just go ahead and jump to the conclusion that this is negative infinity here. And indeed, I, I will accept, would accept that the limit is negative infinity there, because it is once we define that. Y'all are just a very bright group, so we're going to go ahead and define it that way now. But this limit, I would say, is negative infinity. If you said it does not exist there, I would not count that wrong, because you are right to be this early into calculus this year this year, year. So, if you got any questions on that, we will do that in a second. Uh, we'll answer those questions. We're going to talk now, a uh, quick review of just yesterday in general, and then we're going to talk about um, how, some more mathy stuff. So you can be getting out O2 if you haven't gotten it out, and this is not on O2 for you. So, as you look at this graph that I've got up there, what would you say is the limit of this function as x approaches 2? Ms. Johnson? Zero, okay. The limit as x approaches 2 is zero right there, okay. What about the limit as x approaches 1? Anyone? As x approaches 1. Does not exist. All right. Um, Mr. Wells, can you tell us why it does not exist? At one. Why does the limit does why is the limit does not exist at one? Uh, there's no open ended. It's open ended there, it's close ended there. Oh sorry, I was looking at I was looking at the place where it was circled in green. Ah, I got you. Because the it doesn't lead to one choice. Exactly. This side goes there, left side goes to negative one, right side goes to two. Therefore, it, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, you don't have a limit there because it doesn't go to a single point. How many places on the graph as you see it does the limit not exist? How many places does the limit not exist? Four. Four. Two. Two. I have an answer of four. I have an answer of two. Okay. Miss Johnson, would you go and circle the places where you say the limit does not exist? We know there's one because we've just talked about it. All right. All right. Ms. Johnson says the limit does not exist at those four areas. Now, Ms. Frazier is anxiously coming up to say, I think it's these two. Pick a different color, please, ma'am. All right. Okay. Ms. Frazier says it's only at those two places. Um, who would like to, Mr. Wells, which one would you like to defend? Uh, the one with the 
Okay, why do you say that these two limits exist then? Because though there's two dots, if one of both the lines from both sides lead to only one. Okay, so you're saying here that the limit as x approaches 3 does exist then, and what are you saying is that limit? I think it's negative 2. I think so. I think it's negative 2. And you're saying because it's coming from the left and the right, it's going to the same place that the limit does exist. Okay? Right. And, and Ms. Johnson agrees now. So she is rescinding her green circle here and says that the limit does exist at this point and the limit's negative 2. And by the same token, the limit does exist here. Uh, one to uh, negative three, uh, and we will call that one to positive three, okay? So yeah, it's very confusing, and that's the reason I purposely gave you this picture. It, students always want to get into the fact that the limit and the function value are different, so then the limit doesn't exist. That's not the case. That's something else. We'll learn about it on Monday, okay? But right now, the limit doesn't exist at these two red circles here, that the limit doesn't exist at negative 1 and it doesn't exist at positive 1. So we learned how to evaluate limits graphically yesterday. We learned how to evaluate them numerically. What does numerically really mean? Look at chart. Create, plug some numbers in, see what it's looking like. Do either of those, do either of those qualify as math in your opinion? No. What's math? Math is something that's rock solid here. Math is something math is something that I've got to do something with. I've got to move something to the other side of the equation or I've got to factor something and I got that's math, okay? Well truly what we just did is higher level math, okay? And we're gonna have to continuously come to the back to that. But today we're gonna do what y'all think of as math. You'll be very happy with that, I think, for about five minutes, okay? How can we evaluate limits algebraically or analytically? You know, those two are interchangeable, okay? So if I give you a function, if I say, what's the limit as x approaches 4 of 2x squared minus 7x plus 9? What can I do with that, okay? And the answer is, yes, you could graph it. Yes, you could create a table. But it's so much easier to just do some algebra to it. So we give you a very simple thing to do, and that's plug in the value. So the first thing I'm going to do to evaluate this algebraically is I'm going to plug in 4. And I'm going to say 2 times 4 squared minus 7 times 4 plus 9. Real simple. Now, once I do that, one of three things is going to happen. Okay? If I get a number out of this, I do the happy dance. Okay? A number means a happy dance, means I've evaluated the limit. Poof, there it is. Nothing else to do. Yes, you do the happy dance. Second thing that could happen is I could get a number on the top and a zero on the bottom. Oh, yes! That, that makes us go, ugh, because we know that can't work, okay? But it's actually not the end of the world because now I've got three choices for my answer. My answer is either infinity, or negative infinity, or does not exist. So I've narrowed it down to three choices. And I mean, that's a lot less choices than I had just five minutes ago, okay? And we're going to show you how to do that. But once you get it narrowed down to one of these, then what I would do is I'd plug in some numbers close to it, and that will usually tell you both sides are going to infinity, both sides are going to negative infinity. They're going different places, so the answer is DNA. Okay? That's nice when that happens. 
The most common thing that's going to happen, though, is you're going to get zero over zero. That's called the indeterminate form. We can't determine what the, the limit is in indeterminate form. So we've got to do some math. We've got to do some algebra. We've got to factor something. We've got to pull the trig identities out and use some trig identities. We've got to rationalize the numerator or rationalize the denominator. We've got to do something that we think of as math and then start the whole process over again, okay? Now, here's what's going to happen to you within the next 30 minutes, okay? We're going to work several problems, and you're going to get just engrossed in the math down here. Boy, I love doing this. And you're going to do it, and you're going to do it, and do it. And by the end of the period, at least one of you is going to miss a problem because you don't start off with plugging in the value at the beginning. Because if you plug in the value to begin with, and you get a number out, poof, stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Don't go any further. That's the first step always. But invariably, students get so engrossed in the math down here that they want to jump down here and do this always. Okay? So I've told you what's going to happen. Solve the problem. Now, it's important that you get in the habit of using good terminology with this and that you get in the habit of writing down things that are correct mathematically. You are evaluating the limit now. What are you going to do first? Plug in the number. Okay, I've already got this written down. Now, when I'm plugging in the number, I'm actually evaluating the limit. I am not going to write the limit as x approaches 2 again. I'm simply going to write 4 times 2 squared plus 3. I get 19. That's what you should be writing down there, okay? Or some of you are brilliant. You don't even need to write down the 4, 2 squared plus 3, and you can just write down the 19. Those of you that didn't get 19, you have a problem. Okay? What does that mean for us? That's the limit. We're done. Now, what does that mean graphically? That's right. If I'm looking at this, the graph of this function, where do I expect the function to be around the number x equals 2? Okay, so I expect the function to be up here somewhere. All right? Very good. Find the limit. Think I got that right? Happy, happy, joy, joy. The limit's two. Boom. We're there. Okay? Evaluate the limit. That's right. So should I infer from that that you did not get 0 over 0? Um, oh, I did get 0 over 0. 25 minus 5 minus 30 over 5 minus 5. I get negative 10 over zero. So now, that's not our answer. But what do we know? Right. We've got one of three choices now. It's either going to be negative infinity or it's going to be infinity 
or it's going to be does not exist. How do you think we should figure that out? Coin toss. Coin toss? Graph it. Graph it. Pick one number greater than five or one number less than five, a little greater and a little less. Okay. I, and, and all three of you are right, okay? Coin toss is the, the, the most risky of the three there, but you could do that, okay? If you graph this on your calculator, you're going to get a picture, and hopefully you can figure out from that. Or if you do what Mr. West said and you pick a number just a little bit bigger than five and a little bit smaller than five and see what's happening with it, okay? So I encourage you to do both or one of those right now. Those of you that want to graph it, graph that puppy. Those of you that want to do um, the other, do the other. I'm going to graph it to begin with, and let's see what we can come up with. Okay. All right. So we are looking at around the number five. Okay. What does the graph indicate to you? Does not exist. How can you determine that from the graph, Mr. Wells? Okay. If I look at it from the left side, the graph is going down. And think of it as going down, as moving, it's down here at negative infinity. If I look, that's the right side, isn't it? Over here we said that it's negative infinity here. Uh, the, to the right of 5, the, it's negative infinity. And to the left of the 5, it's positive infinity. Now, I could have messed up something on the graph there. I don't know. I could have messed up something on the graph. I don't think I did, but I could have. So the graph seems to indicate does not exist. What do your numbers indicate? Okay. she got negative numbers for 4.9 over there? Really? Oh, no, no. Oh, you're looking at negative 5. This is x equals negative 5. We're looking at x equals positive 5. Yes. Yeah. Let's look at positive 5 at what's happening, Okay. Look at it, around, at, and at 5, you should get an error. Why should you get an error at 5? Because it's undefined, so it can't be anything there. But what's happening just to the right of five, positive 5 and just to the left of positive 5? Hopefully, just to the right of positive 5, you get positive numbers. And just to the left of positive 5, you get negative numbers. Oh, I'm, yeah, to the, to the right, I'm, I said that wrong. Just to the right, you should get negative numbers. That's not where I want to be. I want to be right here. Uh, bueno? Yes, sir. On the red line on the right? Yes, sir. You're saying, does this keep going up over here? Good, good question. And I can tell you the answer that it's going to keep going up, and in a few weeks you'll be able to tell me the answer that it just keeps going up to, that it's never going to curve back down over here. Exactly. It curves at an infinitely slower slope. Brilliant. It approaches infinity. So why is are they going in different directions? So it's not okay, but we're, remember, we're looking at it specifically at x equals five right here. At the number five, just to the right of five, this function is down here at a negative number. It's a negative number, and it's going up and up and up and up and up, and it's just going to keep going up like that. Okay, at positive five, on the other side of it. It's going up without bound right here. But it's going to keep going up and up. It's never going to get to 5. How do I know it's never going to get to 5? Uh, because we plug in five. That's right. If we plug in 5, what do we get? 
if we get an error. So we know it's never going to get to five. It's just going to keep going up and up. So looking at it just at this one moment in time, this side, if we're looking at it, we expect it to keep going to positive infinity. This side, the right side, if we look at it, we expect to see it going to negative infinity. What if you just follow it the other way up? What do you mean? You said it's Yes, it, over here. But now that's talking about the limit at a totally different point. If I'm looking at it this way, that's not the limit as X approaches 5. 5 is right here. That's the limit as X approaches 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 or a million out there, okay? We've got a bunch of limits we could evaluate there, okay? So do you see now, by drawing the picture or by looking at the numbers, you should be able to get the answer there. For those of us that are really paranoid, we're going to do both. And if you're using your calculator, how hard is it to do both? You graph the puppy, then do a table set around five, and poof, you get both answers there, okay? But they should support one another. You should see totally different numbers on the opposites, on left and right of five, and the graph should be going in two different directions. That tells you the, that, the graph, that the limit does not exist, okay? So that's one where you get a number over zero. All right, what happens right here? Is, that, is this the next one? Okay, all right. And when you look at this one, probably just by looking at it, you don't even have to plug anything in. You see I get 8 over, excuse me, I get 0 over 0. Okay? Now that's the indeterminate form, okay? You don't have to write it down that it's the indeterminate form, but I am just so you'll know I can spell that. Um, the indeterminate form. So what do we need to do? We need to do some algebra. All right? What kind of algebra do you think, do you, do you see that we could possibly do? Break down the top part. Okay. Expand it, simplify it. Yes, we can expand the top. Now, could we plug in some numbers? We sure could. But that's going back and doing it analytically. That's not math. That's something else. That's numbers. So we need to expand this analytically if we can. And here's where students get lazy and don't want to write down the top proper things here. We are not evaluating the limit yet. So you must continue writing that. We're only factoring the function at this particular time, okay? So we still have to write down the limit as x approaches 2. x minus 2 is going to stay on the bottom. That's about as factored as it can get. Now, how do we factor the numerator? Who remembers how to factor that? It's a plus and a minus. You're right. There's several different things. Some teachers teach the acronym SOAP. I don't know if you all have heard of that. All right. Here's the formula that I remember for the difference of cubes. A cubed minus B cubed. All right. How are we going to do that? It's going to be A the same sign, B, that's the cube root of the first one and the cube root of the second one. And then the next one, it's going to be the A squared, the opposite sign of that right there, plus the two things multiplied together, A, B. The last sign is always positive. Remember, same, opposite, always positive. And the last thing squared will be B squared. That's kind of the formula for factoring difference of cubes. You did that somewhere in Algebra 2, and you forgot it, but you've got to remember it now. So same opposite, always positive. So following that formula, what will happen with this x cubed minus 8? It will become what in factored form? x minus 2 x squared plus 2x plus 4. Very good. Y'all have no idea how often students get stuck on how to factor difference of cubes there. So y'all have done well with that. Now, you're probably inside doing the happy dance because you see something math you can do. What can you do? You can cancel the x minus 2 and the x minus 2. Okay, so we did some algebra, and poof, we can cancel something out. 
Then we go back and start this whole process over again. Plug in our number. Are we going to get something over zero this time? We are? No. We're going to get a number this time. We are really happy. We know we're going to get the answer now. Okay? So we know we're going to get an answer this time. So when we plug in 2, we're going to say 2 squared plus 2 times 2 plus 4. We get the number 12. So now we know we have completed the problem. We know that's the answer. The limit is 12. Okay? So do you sometimes just get 0 over 0 when the, where the thing you're plugging the number into is in 2 plus 4? That's a very good question, and it's a loaded question, honestly. Yes, that would mean, algebraically, that means that it's not in simplest form. But this function here is a different function from this one here, graphically. These two graphs differ. How do they differ? I got rid of the x minus 2. If you were to, on your calculator right now, graph this, and your buddy next door graph this x squared plus 2x plus 4, you would probably lean over there and say, he has no idea what he's talking about. These two things look identical. But they're not identical. They are identical. The graphs look identical everywhere except Why? Right. This first, the original function we had, the graph has a hole at 2. It's a tiny hole. You can never zoom in enough to see that hole. The graph of this x squared plus 2x plus 4 right here does not have that hole at that point. So these graphs look identical except at that one point. So if you could zoom in enough, you would see that this graph looks like a parabola, and at the number 2, there's a T90 hole. Now, there's no graphing calculator or graphing program on your uh, iPad that if you graph this, it's going to be able to zoom in enough to see that hole. It's not going to be possible. But if you look at the numbers, if you look at it numerically, you'll see that there's an error right here at this point, at the point 2. It's going to be 11.99 on one side and 12.01 on the other side, but it won't give you 12 anyway there. Okay? Very good. Very good. So that's the three ways, three possibilities when you're, when you're evaluating them algebraically. You could plug the number in and poof, get a number out. Do the happy dance. You could plug a number in and get a number over zero. You've got it narrowed down to three, po three, three choices in. Either guess, graph it, or analyze it uh, with numbers. Or you could get zero over zero, which is the indeterminate form, and you need to do some algebra. So let's look at the next problem. Yes, it, it shows it on... See, She's done it as a um, table set, and you can see it says error. But if you were to graph it, you just look at the graph, you're not going to see that hole there, just looking at the graph. When you look at this problem, plug in zero, and you get zero over zero. So the question on the floor at the moment is, how do I simplify that? Okay, it's a technique called rationalizing, that should bring a bell, the numerator. Back in Algebra 2, you did something called rationalizing the denominator. Y'all remember that? Why did we rationalize the denominator? Yes, somebody said in Algebra we can't have a square root on the bottom. We don't like square roots on the bottom is a more accurate statement, but we can have them, but we don't like them there. Well, in order to simplify this, we have to go through a similar process, and we're going to rationalize 
the numerator. How do we rationalize the numerator? We're going to multiply it by the number one. We're just going to multiply it by a special name for the number one. That special name is whatever the numerator is with an opposite sign between the two terms. Does anybody remember the special name that we gave for something that has an opposite sign between it like that? Conjugate. Very good. Conjugate, okay? This is the conjugate of it. So we're multiplying it by the conjugate of the numerator. It doesn't change it. Why does it not change it? We're multiplying it by one. It just makes it look different. If this said x square root of x plus 1 plus 2 here, then yes, we uh, minus 2 there, we would do plus 2 here. It's whatever. This term's going to stay the same. This term's going to stay the same, and the sign in the middle is going to change. So it doesn't matter what's in the square root. It doesn't matter what's in the square root there, okay? So when we multiply that out, now I'll tell you this. In the denominator, don't multiply the two things together. Just write them down. We haven't evaluated the limit yet, okay? So we've still got to write it as a limit as x approaches 0. Now when I'm multiplying the numerator, I should get some stuff that, that will cancel out. So if I do first term times first term, square root times square root, gives me just what's inside the square root. Outside and inside cancel each other out. Do you all see that? If I multiply the square root of x plus 1 times a positive 1, and the square root of x plus 1 times a negative 1, those two things are going to cancel out. And then if I do last times last, I get minus 1. And I'm going to leave the denominator just like it is, meaning I'm just going to write down what I've got there. I'm not going to, multi I'm not going to distribute that x through there. You can do it if you want to. You're going to have to undo it in the next step. So I'm lazy. I'm not going to do it. All right. Now, again, hopefully your algebra brain is kicked in and you just see math and whew, you're just doing algebra there. So tell me what you're doing or thinking right now. Do you see anything that you can simplify? She says the plus 1 and the minus 1 in the top can cancel out. So that gives me, I still haven't evaluated the limit yet, so that will just give me what in the numerator? X. X. And now you start getting real excited and you write in gibberish where you cannot read your own writing because you see, oh, there's an X in the numerator and the, bo and the denominator. Holy cow. I can cancel that out. So the idea is that, that so you just multiply the fraction by yeah, that's that's the in this case, there's not a generality of you always do this or every time it works that way. You've got to be able to pull a lot of different things together in this class. But we see that the X's will cancel, and that's exciting. And then we look a little further and we should even get more excited. Why? We're going to get a number out of it we see this time. So now we're going to put in, and it's not two. It's almost. It's one half. I get a one on the top and a two on the bottom. Okay? How do we feel there, people? Now, what does that mean graphically? If I graph this Function, tell me what I should expect around the point zero. Doesn't exist, so there's a hole. And what else? The function should be about how high or low. That's right, it should be really close to a half. Now, I don't know what's happening with the rest of this function, but I know right around zero there's a hole, 
and the functions at a half. Now, it might be going straight in or down like this or up like this. We don't know what it's doing, but it's right around a half at that particular point. Okay? How did I know to rationalize the numerator? There's a square root in the numerator. Okay? You plugged in and you couldn't get anything out, so you had to do something. Anytime you see a square root in the numerator, rationalizing is probably your best bet. I said probably because it's not always, but it's probably your best bet there, okay? All right, let's let you try one on your own there. See what happens. X over X plus 2 quantity cubed minus 8. We need to evaluate this. Well, there's not a square root, so I don't think that's going to help any. Does plugging in give you anything? If you plug in the zero, do I get an answer out? Zero for zero. So it's indeterminate form, so I need to do some algebra. Okay? Do I need to rationalize something, you think? Why not? There's, we don't have any square roots. What else is there to do in algebra? Polynomials. polynomials. What do we do with polynomials? Yeah. Factor. Them. Factor. So can we factor? People are saying that there's cubes in here, okay? Do you really see some cubes in here? Yeah. Okay. What do you see with that? Because there's two different things you could do here. Oh. And those that are just busily working saying, I wonder if I saw the easy thing or the hard thing. What do you see when you look at this? What, do you, what did you jump into and say, let's do this? Soap, yeah. meaning factoring out like we did on the last one. Okay. So Macy said, I'm looking at this denominator and I'm going to factor it like I did a couple of slides ago. Is that what everybody did? That's what I would have done, so it's okay if you did that, okay? No one looked at this and said, I can cube this out and then subtract 8. You could do that also. You'd get to the same place. I think probably the factoring is probably a little bit easier than what I just said for you to do. But if we, let's try the factoring. It's a more useful thing. When we factor... What goes into our first binomial? X plus 2, that's the cube root of this first thing, the same sign, and the cube root of the second thing, X plus 2 minus 2. And once you write that down, you should say, ah, I see how this is going to help me. Because why? And that's going to become X. It's going to cancel with the top, and you're already two steps ahead, and you're, you're doing your happy dance. But now, let's be sure that we get the trinomial done right. It's x plus 2 squared, opposite sign, which is plus, the 2 and the x plus 2 multiplied together. And you can write it down like this, 2 parentheses x plus 2, or you can go ahead and multiply them together, whichever makes you happy. Always positive, and we're going to square the last number, which is 4. Okay? And now, because we're smart, we're saying, oh, I can do all kinds of algebra here. I can see that this x plus 2 minus 2 is just going to become x, which will cancel with this thing up here. So I'm going to get 1 on the top and 12 on the bottom. So the limit is 1 12. Are we happy with that? 2 squared, 4, plus 4, plus 4. Uh, the numbers messed us up there. I put in X. Okay. All right. I'll stop talking and let you get to that point. I have a tendency to ramble and run. Oh, that's going to, oh, that's going to be fun. Ah, you don't know. You know how to do that. Okay. Now I got to that point. You okay. Okay. All right. Can everybody get to that one over twelve? Okay. All right. You going along? Okay.
okay, Tanner? All right, Tanner. Connor? I can tell you, Tanner. I don't know. You got, you got there okay? If you're finished with that one, you can go ahead and be struggling with the other one there. I'd really like to see somebody do the other one the way I've only seen one student do it in six years. I don't think I will. Once you finish there, you've jumped on to this one. The limit is x approaches 9 of root x minus 3 over x minus 9. Ah, uh, we have someone that likes to step up and take the challenge. I like that. Oh, and he, he, he just works it in the air in his mind. Wow. If you can't see the other way, I mean, you're still brilliant. It just... I didn't see it until that student showed me that, that. You're among good company, in my opinion. When I plug in 9, I get 0 for 0 indeterminate form, so I'm going to keep moving. So, Wesley, what are we going to do here, you think? Square root of x plus 3. Very good. And that is the most common thing to do, and that's probably exactly where I would start at. Did you, did you see something else you wanted to do? Yes. Very few of us ever see that x minus 9 will factor. And we, why do we think that x minus 9 won't factor? Because back in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, we were told you can't factor x minus 9. And you can't if you're using integers for uh, powers. But you could actually factor x minus 9 into these two things, and the square root of x minus 3 will cancel, and I'll wind up with the same answer as I would have got the other way. So it's either way you're going to wind up at the same answer, okay? But if we're going to go through, let's think of it uh, the way Wesley said, the way most of us thought, we're going to multiply by the conjugate. So we're going to say the limit as x approaches 9 of x minus 9 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, I keep the x minus 9, and I have the square root of x plus 3. Whoops, it's not all under a root there, Ely. In a parenthesis of root x plus 3. Now I see that, lo and behold, those will cancel. And now I know I can plug in my number, so I'll get 1 over square root of 9 plus 3, which is 1 sixth. And I remember that means if I look at the graph, I'm going to see that it's approaching the number 1 sixth. Okay? Am I moving too fast for us? If I am, tell me to slow down, okay? I have a tendency to move on rather quickly here, so don't be afraid of me. I don't bite normally. This type of problem normally scares students because we have x minus 4. Okay? All right? Y'all be looking at the next one, and let's see. Okay. All right, so you're going to multiply it by the conjugate. And what do we mean by the conjugate, Connor? Uh, that's the opposite sign. Uh-huh, opposite sign there. So work through the algebra to that and see what you come up with there, okay? The rest of you be looking at this problem, and we'll, we'll let one of you come up and show us how to do it there. Talk amongst your friends and enemies and see if you can determine what to do. Remember to plug in to begin with. 
Very good. And what it, on the bottom, just write down the two quantities as indicated multiplications, okay? Do you understand what I mean there? What did you say? We're not going to multiply these two things together. So just in the denominator, we're going to write down the x minus 9 and the square root of x plus 3. And then cancel what will cancel out. Mr. Lee has negative 16. Wow. What did y'all get? Are y'all still puzzled back here? You got zero. Okay. Someone's wrong. Did you get there? Okay, so now that you've got those canceled, go back and plug the 9 in and try to evaluate it. What do you get when you plug 9 in? Since you've only got a 1 in the numerator, you know you're going to have 1, and then on the bottom you got the 6. So what ideas do you have? Can I, what happens if I plug 4 in? You get 0 over 0. 0 over 0, so that doesn't work. I don't have any square roots. Bummer. What do you think we need to do then? Well, can I just move x minus 4 to the top? And tell me how you're getting to that point there. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying this is equivalent to x minus 4 to the negative 1, right? Okay. Do you think if if what if this is true then one third minus one fourth is I don't know one third is point three one fourth is point two five so point three three minus point two five is point oh eight but this is negative one to the negative one negative one to the negative one is not point oh eight is it so. Multiplied by x minus 4, the, both the top and the bottom by x minus 4. Okay, if we do that, if we multiply both top and bottom by x minus 4, that's going to get us x squared minus 16 on the top, which is still going to be a 0 up there. And we're still going to have a 0 on the bottom, so I don't think that's going to help us. All right, you're saying x minus 4 times this. You're saying that the x's would just cancel? Tell me what you... Oh, no, it's way easier. See, we can't... If we do this, we've got x minus 4 times this fraction minus x minus 4 times this fraction. We can do that. I don't know that it's going to get us anywhere. Can't you keep it, like, keep x minus 4 and then you multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator? The reciprocal of the... What's the reciprocal of the denominator? Okay, you're saying do this? No? Ah, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying make this problem into x minus 4 times x over 1, whoops, x over 1 minus 4 over 1. So you're saying that just flipping these two fractions over, okay, so then 1 third minus 1 4, 3 minus 4, you're saying they are reciprocals of one another? Again, this is, if we do this math right here, we'll get 0.08 or we'll get 1 12th. 
is 3 minus 4, 12. So that, all those are great ideas, but they're not reciprocals of one another, so we really can't do that. That's not good math. So what can we do? What can we do to simplify it is really the big question. Okay? Now, there's a lot of things you can do, a lot of things that people teach you to do, but I'm going, I want to get rid of these two fractions. I want to actually make those into one fraction, and then everything y'all are wanting to do is going to fall into place, okay? So how can I make these two fractions into one fraction? Get a common denominator, smiling X, if that rings a bell to you. But we've got to do the indicated subtraction. So we're going to write limit as X approaches 4 of X minus 4. Now, how do we get these here? The common denominator is going to be 4x. All right. What does this first fraction become? 4 minus, what does this last fraction become? X. So now I've got x minus 4 divided by 4 minus x over 4x. Now that I've got just the one fraction in the bottom, now I can do the keep change flip that y'all are wanting to do, okay? So now I'm still keeping my limit terminology because I haven't evaluated the limit yet. I'm going to keep the numerator and flip the denominator over. I've got x minus 4 times 4x over 4 minus x. But x minus 4 and 4 minus x aren't the same thing. So what do we need to do? Of? Um, of uh, okay, so she says, I'm going to take a negative out of this, and I'm going to make this the limit as x approaches 4 of negative 1 times a negative x plus 4. Y'all agree? Y'all understand that that's okay? Because if I multiply those back together, I'll get to x minus 4. And that ne negative x plus 4 is the same as this 4 minus x down here. So now I can cancel that and that out. And I don't no longer have a fraction, so I'm going to do my happy dance, and I get negative 16. All right, listen to me. If you haven't finished homework one yet, you need to go ahead and get it done, those of you that haven't. None of you, I bet, have started on the web assignment this due Friday, so you can get started on it. Don't worry about homework two yet, okay? It says it's due tonight, but we're going to push that off, okay? So the only thing you need to be worrying about is homework one and the web assign. Those are two things you can be working on tonight. We're going to work a little bit more on this tomorrow, work a little bit on three, and then we'll have the rest of tomorrow and all day Friday to work on the two and three homeworks, okay? So we've got those things that are in the hopper there. Today is AP Physics Help. Tomorrow and Friday will be AP Calculus help for those of you that are in that. Okay, so have a good one. Yay. Stay out of trouble. <laughs>